Uh, good evening, everybody. It is six o'clock, um, and uh, thank you for all you who are joining us. Uh, we'll be beginning in just one to two minutes, so for those of you with us, just hang on, and we'll be starting momentarily. All right. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining the Hyde Park Kenwood Community Conference uh, Dialogue on Police Accountability. My name is Ali Amora, and I am a board member with the Hyde Park Kenwood Community Conference, the organization that is hosting tonight's event. Uh, I will be one of your MCs for tonight. Please note uh, this event is being recorded and it is also being live streamed on Facebook. Uh, tonight's dialogue is a chance for all of us to come together as a community, to see one another, to see our neighbors, um, and uh, it's a chance for us uh, to discuss a, a very important topic, not just to our neighborhood and our city, uh, but to the country in general, uh, to discuss police accountability. It's an opportunity for us to hear from local leaders and community members and to get some of our questions answered. So I want to thank everyone for taking the time to be with us tonight, um, and for the, especially for those who are joining us for the very first time. Welcome. Uh, before we begin, I want to take a minute to tell you a bit about our host organization, the Hyde Park Kenwood Community Conference, or HPKCC for short. Uh, HPKCC is an independent community organization whose mission is to connect people in a diverse, green, and safe community. We convene groups and individuals to network and build community around multi-generational activities, community resources, and major issues that affect our future. HPKCC was founded in 1949 by a group of urban pioneers in the Hyde Park Kenwood area. Through its 70-year history, HPKCC has organized committees and task forces to deal with timely issues. The continuing goal of HPKCC is to meet the needs of an ever-changing community, uh, and HPKCC exists to support all of you uh, who are here with us tonight. Uh, over the past several months, HPKCC has held four community virtual events that attracted hundreds of attendees on both Zoom um, and received even more views on Facebook Live. You can, re re uh, res you can view these recordings on those events on HBKCC's uh, YouTube channel. Um, and you can also visit our website, www.hydepark.org, uh, to not only become a member, but also to view some of our past events. Uh, tonight's community dialogue on police accountability is a continuation of the community building and information sharing that occurred during those first events. I'll now just quickly run through our schedule for the evening. Uh, we will have a brief welcome from HPKCC President Phylin Crawford, um, who will then welcome our speakers. Um, and uh, following her welcome, we will move into uh, all of our guest speakers who we have tonight, who will provide us with an overview and information on police accountability. Following that, 
uh, we will have a question and answer session. Uh, now, a note on the questions. Questions for the speakers that were provided in advance will be addressed first. As the evening progresses, you may also comment um, using the chat function um, or ask other questions using the chat function in Zoom. We can't guarantee that we'll get to all of those questions, but we will do our best time permitting. Uh, in addition, tonight, we will also open up our dialogue to live questions at around 7.30. Participants who wish to ask a question at that time should raise their hand in the Zoom app. We will then call on you and participants will be given one to two minutes to ask questions. Uh, as a reminder to all of our participants, please remember that this is a public forum. Out of respect for all the participants, please use appropriate language and keep your questions and comments brief and to the topic at all times. Um, the Hyde Park Kenwood Community Conference reserves the right to mute or remove participants um, for either inappropriate comments or comments that do not relate to the topic at hand. Um, as a reminder, we are recording and live streaming this event on our Facebook page. Uh, now at this time, I'd like to introduce uh, HPKCC board member, President Phylan Crawford, who wants to share a few words on behalf of the board. And Phylan will be joining us momentarily. Hi, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can hear you. All right, very good. Uh, good evening. I don't know where my video is, but let's see. We'll try to get it going here. Okay, good evening. I'm Phylan Crawford, president of the High Park Kenwood Community Conference. Welcome to our fifth virtual community forum. Our topic tonight is account police accountability. We're happy to convene the community once again on an important topic that is so timely and relevant as we continue to operate under the specter of COVID-19. We're lucky to have an all-star panel tonight to explain what police accountability is, what it looks like now, and give us some information on how we can better understand it in the future. Uh, right now, I'd like to get right to our program and introduce our first guest. Let's see, do we have our guests uh, here? Let's see, we have Bokar Ba, Assistant Professor of Economics for the University of California at Irvine. And we also have Roman Rivera, PhD candidate for the Department of Economics at Columbia University. Professor Ba, can you uh, take about five minutes or so to introduce yourself and then we'll hear from Mr. Rivera. Uh, hi everyone, uh, I'm Bocard. So um, we were planning on like uh, presenting jointly with uh, Roman. So Roman is a, a student at like uh, Columbia University and we're gonna talk about like our research on police um, accountability. So the idea, uh, so we trying to understand police accountability in Chicago. So next slide, uh, Roman. Uh, so the idea here is that there is a growing concern about policing in uh, America and all over the world. Uh, there's an increased uh, public attention related to police wrongdoing that undermines the legitimacy of police. Um, uh, police mistakes can be harmful for civilian, could be costly in terms of like reform, DOJ investigation, settlement cases. So for example, Chicago has spent over $110 million dollars in the settlements in 2018. And uh, what are those mistakes? It's for example, police shooting, excessive use of force, false arrest, etc. Uh, from an academic point of view, there are like some challenges in like studying policing and in particular in Chicago, because the data is siloed in individual and individual stakeholders do virtually nothing with the data they, they possess. Uh, the data often depend on agencies that do not necessarily cooperate with each other and it's a very sensitive topic to study. Essentially, as a researcher, often you have to like collaborate with the police department to answer some very tricky question. And uh, some of us have like some red tape and um, we might be missing something for science and the public in general. 
Uh, and there are like some practical challenges uh, in terms of uh, for the public in general. So uh, the main one that we have is that contact with officer is the first interaction with the criminal justice system and the government. And uh, some police officer might engage in like poor behavior and uh, that poor behavior makes it very difficult for defendants to protect themselves and for uh, people who try to help them essentially private attorney or public defendants to access relevant data on police officers. And uh, so uh, next, uh, Roman. Uh, yeah, so one of the solutions to this problem is to create public data tools, uh, something that we've had experience with in the past. So basically we collected, cleaned, and distributed quite a bit of data on the Chicago Police Department and Chicago Police Officers in collaboration with the Invisible Institute. And it's uh, on a website currently called CBD cpdp.co. Um, where you can see various facts about the Chicago Police Department and specific officers themselves. So, for example, there's the profile shown of Jason Van Dyke, who is the former Chicago police officer who murdered Laquan McDonald in 2014. And you can see how many misconduct allegations he had when he got them, how many use of force reports he's filed, how many awards he's gotten, etc. Uh, so this is one tool that's available to the public um, to use in order to learn more about policing and police misconduct. Um, but another uh, thing that can be done with publicly released data uh, is also academic uh, ventures and trying to understand more deeply what's going on behind the scenes. So, yeah. Okay. So essentially uh, what Roman and I and uh, other colleagues we're trying to do is to try to answer some very, very difficult question without having essentially any institution, uh, sorry, uh, any uh, connect, direct connection with the police department or the cities in general. We're trying to answer the question ourselves with publicly available data using the tools that uh, we learn at school. So one question is, does policing the police increase crime? And uh, often like, uh, so for example, for the Lequan cases, the Lequan scandal, people use that scandal to say, oh, because we are policing the police now, crime and public safety is impacted, uh, uh, we cannot police the police. So us, what we did uh, after, uh, essentially, when uh, the Invisible Institute won the lawsuit to have access to the misconduct data in Chicago that Roman presented you in the previous slide, uh, what happened is the police union sent an internal memo to a police officer warning them that like, their complaint will soon be released publicly. And what happened is that it had changed the officer police behavior by essentially they improved their behavior and they decreased the number of complaints related to constitutional violation decreased by 24, 25 to 34% after um, the police union sent that memo. And uh, so constitutional violation complaint are uh, essentially potential suspect of a crime. Um, uh, people who complain about illegal search, verbal abuse, use of force. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we do not find any evidence that uh, crime went up uh, right after um, uh, the release, uh, sorry, the, that announcement from the union, although police officers improve their behavior. So that is one question we try to answer. Uh, 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 independently. Uh, next slide, Roman. Another question we can ask is how do f how much do people uh, how do civilians care about complaining and whether it matters? Okay, so essentially um, in Chicago, it's very easy. To, it's relatively very easy for civilian to complain against the police. For example, they can do it over the phone, uh, over the internet, um, at COPA or IPRA at the time. Uh, at the police station, for example. Um, however, for the complaint to be investigated, at least during my time in Chicago, people had to have uh, to sign an affidavit for their complaint to be investigated. And uh, the so uh, IPRA used to be so passed back in the day was COPA uh, used to be on the south side of the city, so next to the police department headquarter and move up north. So farther away from the south side of Chicago, so uh, farther away, farther away from the African American community on the south side uh, and closer to the white part of the city. And what we find is that like making hard, making it harder for people to complain against the police 
uh, essentially deter civilian to provide feedback to the police and in particular from people seeking help from the police in those uh, difficult neighborhoods. And we also show that in the paper that people who care the most about their complaints, so in particular African American who are willing to sacrifice four hours of their time as opposed to white who are willing to sacrifice two hours of their time, African American the sustain rate is 2.7 percent while uh, for white the sustain rate is 30 percent. So uh, that's like one question we try to answer uh, using the data. Um, next, Roman. Yeah, so uh, another question or set of questions we tried to answer um, using this data uh, have to do with policing in general, not so much police misconduct. So uh, one thing we look at is what drives officers using force, specifically low level force, which as we know from the George Floyd incident as um, well as the Eric Garner incident, low level uses of force, i.e not using a uh, gun or a taser or a baton have significant impacts on people's lives. And so we quite, uh, wonder whether or not it's always rational, if it always has to do with the environment um, and the situation at hand that police officers are dealing with when they decide whether or not to use force. And we find that that's not necessarily the case. So basically, when an officer's former colleague, somebody they went to the police academy with, but who they're no longer working with or aren't in the same area with, gets injured, that officer is then more likely to use force, specifically low levels of force, and is more likely to injure um, a suspect that they're interacting with right after their old friend gets injured. A second question we look at is how diversity impacts officers. So we know from previous research that black and Hispanic um, officers police dif differently. They're less aggressive. They engage in uh, less discriminatory behavior towards minorities but how do uh, they impact their white peers? So in this, we look at police academy cohorts again, and we ask whether or not having more black and Hispanic peers changes how white officers behave in the future. And the answer is it does. It significantly decreases the amount of uh, low level arrests they make in the future for things like drug crime, traffic crime, and municipal code violations. And so that matters significantly uh, looking forward and answer some specific questions about how diversity impacts departments as a whole. Um, thank you. Boker, do you have any final words? So yeah, so we uh, essentially with our research, we try to answer very, I think very important and difficult question at the um, minimum cost, essentially our stipend, uh, researcher, researcher found as an assistant professor and from insight from the community rather than like coming from like a, a high stakeholder from the city. So yeah, and also we distributed all the data publicly for researchers and other people from the public uh, in partnership with the Invisible Institute. Thank you very much. Hi, I'd like to thank you both. And I didn't get to introduce Mr. Rivera. Uh, Mr. Rivera is a PhD candidate for the Department of Economics at Columbia U University. I just want to thank you both. Let's see. All right, coming up next, we have Joe Ferguson. Mr. Ferguson is, is, is Inspector General for the city of Chicago. Uh, welcome, Inspector. Uh, please tell us about your work with the City of Chicago and police accountability. Hi, can everybody hear me? Because I keep cutting, the network keeps cutting out on me. So can you just confirm I'm here? We can hear you. Okay, great. Um, thanks. Thanks for the invite. Hello to everybody. I'm looking forward to the questions and answers and the conversation that come. Um, I have a um, sort of ambitious uh, sort of list of things that I've been asked to do here. One is to sort of talk about Chicago Inspector General's office, but then place it in the context of the um, overall accountability system and describe that. So the Inspector General's office um, is a component of the city, but entirely independent and separate from the city. It operates functionally um, uh, in a completely disconnected way. All of the work that it does, it does at its own initiative. Um, it does, and all of all of the work that it does, it pushes out into the public domain. Um, the type of work that we do um, falls into um, a number of buckets, if you will. Um, uh, and I'm going to speak about these buckets in relation to um, police and police accountability. Um, the investigative bucket uh, is the oldest part of the office, which has been in existence since 1989. 
um, and it conducts criminal and administrative investigations of wrongdoing by police officials. Um, uh, over the years, um, uh, the, police, the police department um, in Chicago, um, much the same as is the case with large municipalities across the country, have had their own sort of specialized parallel invest disciplinary investigative systems and agencies. Um, the uh, jurisdiction of the Inspector General's office is spanning across the entire city. And from time to time where there is uh, either conflicts of interest or problems or a matter involving special factors, um, we'll exercise that jurisdiction to um, uh, in place of those police specific uh, investigative bodies. So um, an example of that would be the administrative investigation done of the department's handling of the, Laqu the Laquan McDonald um, uh, shooting. Um, and as a consequence of that, um, uh, 16 officers were recommended for discipline, um, 11 of them for firing, um, 15 of the 16 actually were disciplined um, uh, or dis charges were brought against them. A number of them resigned or separated from the department before um, they actually, the, 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 the charges were um, uh, finalized and they were fired, um, but it removed um, uh, uh, 10 people from the department and another five got significant suspensions. One of the largest single investigations of misconduct in the history of the city of Chicago, and actually the largest one um, uh, in the last 50 to 60 years. All of it for um, uh, how it was that the department in the immediate aftermath of the shooting handled and pursued um, the fact of the shooting. And many of the officers um, ultimately had charges brought against them for lying, uh, for making false statements in their official reporting in the matter um, and along the way. So that's the investigation section. Um, uh, the audit and program review section um, does federal standard uh, performance audits of government functions, and some of them include the police department. So an example uh, of that relating to the police department was a two-year study of the department's um, uh, overtime practices. Um, and the police department's overtime practices cost the taxpayer enormous amounts of money um, it is the norm. Uh, it is the actually it's the exception um, rather than the rule that the department actually stays with it within its budget for overtime. And most years, it literally doubles the amount of spending on overtime. And what we found was a system that simply did not work at all in terms of accountability. Um, and there were lots of practices that were customary practices um, that many of us would look at and say, those are just wrong, if not possibly unlawful. Um, but it has resulted in uh, the department having to agree to clean up a, a really a fundamental aspect of its operations um, that also uh, feeds into its actual understanding of what its employees are doing. Another component of the office is the public safety section. The public safety section is the newest part of the office. It's, it, it was um, brought into existence by law at the end of 2017. Um, at the recommendation of the Police Accountability Task Force and the Justice Department doing the pattern and practice review of the use of force um, by the Chicago Police Department. And it is situated within the Office of Inspector General. It's a dedicated unit that, that since 2018 does nothing but examine, evaluate, and do inspections of the operations of the Police Department, um, COPA, which is um, uh, the primary uh, civilian investigative agency that Sidney Roberts is gonna talk about, investigating the most serious types of police misconduct allegations, those involving the use of force, um, the department's Bureau of Internal Affairs and the police board. And um, we do evaluations and inspections and the evaluations part um, uh, results in public reporting of all sorts of things that you've seen in the news lately. Um, there's much discussion um, and uh, much engagement around the presence of, of police officers in school, school resource officers. Um, there was a five uh, hour hearing uh, a week ago in the city council at which I testified on the basis of a report that we issued in the fall of 2018 um, that said that the department's management of that program um, violated or just was not in compliance with just about every federal best practice for having officers in school um, and so there weren't standards for recruitment. There was, not, there was not training by the department for officers who were being placed in juvenile uh, environments. There was no agreement between CPD and CPS for the ground rules as to what officers can and can't do within the schools. Um, and uh, there was no effective sort of supervisory uh, system respecting those officers. So 
all of that brought into the public domain, feeding the, feeding the campaign for, or, or the dialogue, the civic dialogue about whether we should have officers in school, and if we are, um, under what sorts of criteria. Um, uh, another example uh, is a recent report on the Juvenile Intervention Support Center um, uh, of CPD. And um, that is a program that is supposed to be a diversionary program um, for juveniles um, who have been arrested for um, low-grade offenses um, and who don't have any prior or significant criminal history. And it is supposed to operate in a way that actually takes them out of and removes them from the criminal justice system and puts them in a social service supporting environment. Um, and that's not how the program has operated for years. And so public report resulted in a five hour hearing three weeks ago on that um, with another hearing to come. Um, uh, and um, uh, some of the things that we do um, sort of grab immediate attention and people understand their significance. Other than, others of them are really big and complex and more obscure, but just as important. A recent report on the, on, on the department's management of records, um, which everyone would say, what does that have to do with policing? Well, it has everything to do with policing. If the department doesn't have a record management system that allows it to actually identify and produce records that criminal defendants are entitled to when they're going through the criminal justice system, um, we have fundamental legitimacy issues in the criminal justice system itself. That report has resulted in a working group involving all of the um, institutions of the criminal justice system, the public defender, the Cook County State's Attorney's Office, the courts, um, and uh, the um, criminal defense bar, and so on and so forth, coming together and beginning to work on something that they've all accepted over the years, which is substandard compliance with constitutional procedural requirements affecting the outcomes of, 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 of the criminal justice system. The IG does its work, and particularly the public safety section, um, its oversight work uh, is part of um, a multi sort of uh, component oversight system created in the wake of the Justice Department's report and the Police Accountability Task Force's report, one of which is COPA, the Civilian Office of Police Accountability, which I'm going to let Sydney speak to. The IG actually examines its work as well um, and looks at all uh, concluded investigations with findings um, to assess them for whether or not they have been done to full effect. Um, and so where there are material omissions or shortcomings, those are referred back to the department um, for completion. Um, uh, the police board, there's a lot of talk about the police board over the years as a significant component of the system. It is an adjudicatory body that actually sits um, uh, as judges for a tiny percentage of the overall cases and disciplinary matters brought against um, officers. The reason that's in the public spotlight is they tend to be the most significant ones, the ones that, 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 that involve um, uh, uh, um, attempts to discharge or, or, or levy significant suspensions on the, uh, against the officers. Um, uh, and there is another leg of the system that is not in creation yet that I know is going to be the subject of uh, some of the Q&A, and that is um, a civilian board or commission. Um, there are two proposals that are sitting with the city council right now, um, one from the GAPA organization, one from the CPAC organization. Both of them are incredibly long delayed for meaningful engagement by the city council. And I would say one of the reasons that we need um, a civilian board of some sort with some powers is over the years, the city council has not conducted itself in a way um, that, 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 that they should be, which is providing rigorous legislative oversight of the actions of the executive branch, the mayor's office, which controls the police department. Um, the city council is starting to step into that space, but in the absence of that, historically, um, the people of the uh, the people in the community, the citizens of the city, have not had a meaningful representative um, actually sort of calling out and having hearings on critical issues of critical importance regarding policing and constitutional policing. So the IG component, the public safety section, COPA, the civilian commission. Um, and there is one more big player in all of this, and that's the consent decree monitor. Um, and the consent decree, um, uh, I think, 
I think quite often people think of, of the consent decree in the presence of a federal judge um, whose representative is monitoring the activities of the police department as a kind of panacea, which is going to change everything. Um, there are really important things that this consent decree, an agreement between the city and the plaintiffs in a, the civil, right act, civil rights action brought in a, 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 on the basis of the uh, Justice Department's pattern and practice findings. Um, but the consent decree monitor can only do what's, the police monitor can only do what's within the bounds of this legal document and nothing more. And that's why all these other components are really important for them to be doing their work as well. Um, uh, if I could speak for like two more minutes and I could have the screen shared so I can jump on and show something to everybody. All right, couple minutes, Inspector, please. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Make sure she knows you want to share the screen. You can share your screen, Inspector. Okay, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, folks can see the website that's up? Not yet. Not yet. All right. Um, let's see if I'm going to be able to do this. Would you? Okay. Oh, there we go. I got it. I think. Right. Okay. Five, four, three, two, one. Please try one more time. Uh, you're sharing the screen now can you see it we can we'll see, see the, city the of desktop Chicago. yeah um all right i don't think it's going to work so I, I tell you what you can unshare and i'll just speak very quickly um uh uh, uh bokar um and roman uh, uh just spoke about um data and data portals um, uh, the, IG, the IG itself, the public safety section, the Office of the Inspector General has a data portal as well. IGChicago.org, on the homepage you'll see information portal. The biggest um, uh, component of the portal are dashboards on the police department and, the, and police activities. And so in addition to all of the information um, that is up on the Invisible Institute's website, um, which is beyond the Invisible Institute, we clean the data as well, but we can also validate the data in ways that the Invisible Institute cannot because we have access to all sorts of other data because under the law, the department is supposed to give us direct access to its data. Um, but ah, there we go, who's doing that? Um, if you can click on the information portal quickly. So that's the home page. Coming up in a second, the information portal, if you scroll down just a little bit um, and click go to public safety, CPD. And thank you for the assist here. And um, you will see a bunch of um, dashboards, one for active sworn officers, which will give you the entirety and all sorts of demographic characteristics and the details and the assignments of um, every single officer in the department, um, the demographics of the officers, the tenure, the average tenure by district, um, the, the race and gender composition by district level for the department overall. Um, if, you jump, if you jump back one, because um, I'm going to just quickly jump to another so that I don't take up too much more time, um, uh, jump to complaints notifications. And so there are numerous visualizations um, on Tableau visualizations that go to complaint notifications and trends, complaint history for each individual officer. Um, that's validated information in addition to cleaned information. It's broken down by district. There's um, uh, by ward, by community area. It contains all of the outcomes of every single allegation um, raised in the context of any complaint that's brought against an officer. If you jump back, one, um, in addition to that, um, you, uh, there are two um, very important dashboards, investigatory stops and tactical response reports. Investigatory stops, um, officers need to file those um, when they make a, when, in a street encounter in which they've actually stopped somebody on the street. And um, there are, if you can click on that quickly, um, There are numerous separate um, uh, visualizations of that. Um, aggregate number, 
um, stops on the basis of the activity that's involved in the stop as well, the basis for the stop, um, pat down, searches, seizures, each of these broken out by officer, by district, by beat, um, the demographic characteristics of the subject, the demographic characteristics of the office, patterns, it's done by ward, and it's done in comparison to census demographics so that you can see the racial disparities um, that exist between the population of the particular district um, uh, within which the stop occurred um, and the incidence of stops themselves. We're in the middle of a, of a report that we will issue on disparities on exactly that. If you jump back one more, I wanna show one more sort of at a high level feature and then I'll stop. The last um, major area is tactical response reports. And if you can click on that, tactical response reports are what needs to need to be filed by officers when they use any type of force. And so this is really important in the moment. Um, and uh, so there's overview. Um, this is the same sort, the same sort of information, the demographics of the, of the officer using the force, the demographic information of the subjects, the basis uh, and some of the circumstantial information for the claimed use of force. Um, if you click on the TRR map and census data at the bottom, Um, you will, uh, and these are the, and, and, and I should say that all of these have filters um, that allow you to sort of change the visualization of what you're saying. And here you can see, you can break, you can do it by district. You can do it by district, um, by race, by gender. Um, you can do it by um, uh, district in relation or comparison to the population. We're actually enriching that data to move beyond the population itself and include some other cre um, critical information. Um, uh, that is drawn from socioeconomic um, public data. Um, but all of these inform our work. We believe they inform the public. They certainly are increasingly informing the work of the city council. But it's a lot of operation, not just the composition of the department, but of the activities of the department that are most interest and concern to the community generally. So I'll stop there and, and uh, turn it over to others. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Inspector Ferguson. That was very interesting information. Should be very useful to the community. I'd like to move on to our next speaker. We have Sydney Roberts, the Chief Administrator for the Civilian Office of Police Accountability. We have a note, Ms. Roberts must leave us at 7.30. Uh, thank you, Chief Roberts. Can you introduce yourself and talk about your work on police accountability? Sure. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, really uh, happy to be here um, and to participate on this panel. I mean, uh, when we talk about police reform and police accountability, for me, it is the most important issue, not only facing Chicago, but facing the country as a whole. Um, and I deliberately say police reform before police accountability, because I firmly believe that the best police accountability system in the world is not going to reform a flawed policing system. And so when we think about police oversight and accountability, we have to remember one very important thing, and that is because our constitution grants us the right to life and liberty, we also allow law enforcement to deprive us of those rights. And so the government has a duty to ensure that the deprivation of those rights are subject to the strictest scrutiny and non-compliance is subject to consequence. And so it's with this backdrop that, that COPA exists. Now, Chicago has had civilians conducting police oversight investigations since 1976. Uh, Chicago was and remains a pioneer in civilian oversight. Today, there are still only a few handful of oversight bodies with exclusive authority to investigate misconduct by their departments and even fewer that have the authority to require the department to act on those recommendations. Now that said, OPS and IPRA, they endured legitimate criticisms ranging from a lack of independence, meaningful authority, underfunding, they lack transparency, and there was questions about the integrity of the investigative process. In COPA, we have worked to overcome these operational flaws. COPA is independent of the mayor. We have no reporting authority to the mayor. We have no reporting obligation to the mayor. We don't preview our findings with the mayor's office, nor do we take investigative direction from the mayor. We have a dedicated funding floor of 1% of CPD's budget. 
Our budget is $18 million. We have an authorized headcount of 151 people. Currently, right now, we're only at about a, uh, 120. Um, we devote 90, 90 staff members, investigators and supervisors to our investigative units. We have 15 attorneys inclusive of supervisors that provide support to those investigations. We too have a data unit that posts police misconduct, uh, police misconduct information and complaint uh, data. We have a public policy unit. Uh, the chief administrator, while appointed by the mayor, must be confirmed by the council and may only be removed for cause. We also have a training division which conducts a six week mandatory training academy for our investigators and attorneys. And while yearly in-service training has been a staple since inception, during the stay at home order, we actually uh, conducted nine live video trainings to our staff. We have a public affairs team with a robust community engagement platform that last year had personal contact with more than 10,000 Chicagoans. And from an investigator standpoint, our jurisdiction, it is administrative. But every single complaint filed against a police officer must be directed to COPA. COPA has to review that complaint and make a jurisdictional determination about whether or not the complaint relies within the jurisdiction of COPA or the Chicago Police Department Bureau of Internal Affairs. Our, as the Inspector General mentioned, our jurisdiction is directed at the most egregious allegations of misconduct and uses of force, specifically excessive force, domestic violence, improper search and seizure, um, verbal abuse that is biased and want unwelcome se uh, sexual advances. Other violations are operational in nature and they are diverted to the Bureau of Internal Affairs. We investigate every single officer involved shooting, every death in custody or deaths as a result of police action. And when it comes to officer involved shootings, we have a response team that responds in real time to every officer involved shootings, whether that's at two o'clock in the morning, six o'clock in the morning, or right in the middle of the uh, afternoon. Our response team includes a deputy chief, a major case specialist, um, an evidence technician. We deploy to the scene, review body worn camera, we'll deploy to the hospital, uh, speak to witnesses, um, to the victims of the individuals who were shot. Um, as, an, as an investigative body, we have the same access to records and staff as if we were internal to the department. And officers must participate in our investigations. They must participate truthfully. And the failure to participate in those investigations or to participate and lie, uh, officers can be subject to discipline and we uh, up to including discharge. We also have subpoena power. And this is the other thing. The department, as I mentioned earlier, they must act on our investigative recommendations, particularly as it relates to discipline. And if they disagree with our recommendations and uh, ultimately the trier of that uh, disagreement actually goes to the police board. Um, we are also more significantly more transparent than we've ever been before as an agency. We release every single investigative summary report onto our website. In the first half of this year alone, we have posted 79 new investigative reports to our website, 35 of which include sustained findings. We also post video, audio, and department records stemming from every single officer involved shootings. Those get posted on our website. This past quarter, we posted seven new transparency. To date, we have posted over 291 incidents. And as I mentioned before, we post complaint and misconduct data. But as the Inspector General mentioned, we are also subject to oversight, oversight of our policies and oversight of our investigative reports. This is carried out by the Inspector General's Public Safety Inspector General. This is carried out by the federal monitors, and it's also carried out by each of you. That said, we are still faced with challenges that impact our operation. Um, the union concept contract and state law, as mentioned by Dr. Ba, complainants must sign an affidavit. That is a barrier to our office receiving complaints. We're barred from acting on anonymous complaints. The investigative process and the discipline process, it remains long and protracted and that impacts uh, the public's confidence and trust in our office. And so 
I will say that despite these challenges, we are making an impact. In the past two years, we have found more shootings unjustified in Chicago than in previous years. In 2019, our sustain rate was 42%. This past quarter, we sustained 27 of the 75 cases we closed with findings. We've sought relief of powers of officers pending investigations. And as you may have seen um, in recent, uh, recent press releases, with respect to protest complaints, we've recommended that eight officers be relieved of their police powers while we conduct these investigations. We're recommending more officers be suspended and terminated than in previous years. This past quarter, we recommended that eight officers be terminated. We've sent three times as many cases to the police board and they have ruled in our favor with respect to discipline recommendations in 77% of the time. And for those cases that have gone to arbitration, they have ruled in our favor 55% of the time. And contrary to the criticisms of IPRA and OPS, COPA has sought the, term, the termination of officers for engaging in a code of silence, as well as for lying during their interviews and in their official reports. And COPA and the city, even with all of this progress, we have more to do. We remain accountable to each of you. And so we have to make more progress and police accountability. We have to make more progress to bring about a procedurally and socially just policing system. Additional accountability measures should include state licensing of police officers and a registry that bars an officer from leaving one department and going to another department. Officers who have been fired for misconduct should have their pensions denied, or at least it should be a consideration we need to remove the barriers to filing a complaint. Officers should be required to undergo yearly recertification, recertification that capitalizes upon, late, upon training opportunities from COPA's closed investigations, situational trainings in use of force and search and seizure, police ethics, problem solving, and I mentioned when I opened that police reform requires more than just an oversight and an accountability system. For too long, law enforcement, particularly in Chicago, has relied upon agencies like COPA, OPS, IPRA, the Bureau of Internal Affairs, and lawsuits to drive police reform. Those measures should not drive police reform or should not be the sole drive of police reform because COPA's responsibility is to respond to misconduct. We should be focusing our efforts on preventing misconduct from occurring in the first place. And while we cannot police our way out of Chicago's crime and violence problem, the same applies. We can't discipline or discharge an individual officer one at a time and let that serve as the basis for eliminating police misconduct or be the sole basis for eradicating bad policing behaviors. And so I'll close with this. Police reform cannot happen with just a civilian oversight and accountability system. Police reform cannot happen without a civilian oversight and accountability system. But even when policing is reformed, we still need a civilian oversight and accountability system to provide trust and legitimacy to the actions of our law enforcement officers. I really appreciate the opportunity that I've had to, to, to speak with you guys um, today to, to hear Inspector General Ferguson, um, the gentleman, uh, Dr. Ba and, and Roman. Um, and I will be able to stay on for about the next 10 minutes, but I do have to uh, sign off to attend a police board hearing uh, momentarily at about seven o'clock. Um, but available to answer any questions that I'm not able to answer is our Chief of Investigative Operations, uh, Andrea Kirsten, she is on the line, as well as Ephraim Edie, our Public Information Officer. So thank you all for giving me an opportunity to be with you. Thank you so much, Chief Roberts. Uh, and I, we know you're busy, so thank you so much for joining us on a busy night for you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on. We got one more guest speaker. Uh, let me welcome Trina Reynolds Tyler. Uh, Ms. Tyler is a data analyst and a community organizer for Data for Black Lives Chicago. 
It says the data for Black Lives Chicago Hub. Ms. Tyler, are you there, please? Is Ms. Tyler there? There we go. Hi. I can hear you, Tyler. Hi. How are you doing today? Hi. Good, doing good. Welcome. Thank uh, please, you. please tell us a little bit about yourself and about the work you're doing. Awesome. So I think, I guess I should first introduce myself as a community member because that's what I am first. I was raised on 54th and Drexel. Mm -hmm. I went to St. Thomas the Apostle right there on 55th and Woodline. And um, I ended up going to De La Salle for high school. Um, so it's really interesting how to come, come around. Oh, and then I went to the University of Chicago Harris School of Public Policy for my master's in public policy, which I just I just graduated um, at the end of, in the beginning of June, I'm sorry. Oh, congratulations. Thank you so much. Um, so it's, re it's really great to come full circle and to hear what folks have already had to say. Um, I specifically really appreciate Sydney Roberts. I mean, that was, that was really an incredible, um, a, a really incredible talk that she just gave. And I really, it, ch it made me change a couple of things that I had to say. So thank you for that. Um, I started organizing work in the city of Chicago through BYP 100. And while I was there, actually, uh, I remember working on the Say Her Name campaign where we were um, rooting for the firing of Officer Dante Servin after he murdered Rakia Boyd, um, a young black woman who was on the west side on her way to a party with a group of friends. Uh, as we rallied together, for in the name of Rakia Boyd, I remember people victim blaming and people uh, talking about how these young folks should have changed their behavior in order to like accommodate this off-duty officer. Um, and I really felt incredibly frustrated by the, the narratives that we have around how uh, these, these instances of violence are isolated events, when in fact we've seen over time that it doesn't really matter how young people or, or people generally are responding to things. Um, police officers are often in the power um, to, to react and decide what, what really a moment that could change the rest of your life. And I just wanna honor Rakia Boyd in this moment just to say that as we, as we rallied at the Chicago Police Board hearings, um, when it came time to fire Dante Servin, Dante Servin was able to resign. And so that being said, Dante Servin re retains his pension and can also essentially become a police officer anywhere else um, in the country uh, with, and, and just live his life in the way that he desires. But, but Rakia Boyd's family will never get that back. Um, that moment made me think about all of these stories and how they're related to one another and led me to the Invisible Institute. I see some familiar faces on here and research that Professor Ba and Roma Rivera had already done. Um, I learned about people like Dan Diane Bond, whose experience is reflected in settlement data, right? She, she, you might be more familiar with settlement data through the Laquan McDonald story where his family offered what was received a settlement instead of, um, and, and what many people believe was instead of charges against Jason Van Dyke, um, it's, it's clear that uh, Jason Van Dyke was not, did not receive charges until there was like large uproar, uproar from people in the community. And that happens quite a bit. In fact, in 2018, Chicago spent more than $113 million on police misconduct settlements. And so in cases of settlements, it's really not, there's no guarantee that police accountability will happen. And you leave families, the way that this system is set up is that you leave families with the decision. Are you going to take this money? Are you going to receive the settlement? Or are you going to pursue charges? And is this police officer in jail justice to you? And for many people, people like me, justice does not look like people being in prisons or jails. Justice looks like systemic change. If you looked at settlement, settling for misconduct, it, uh, it's a database that the Chicago reporter made for, between, for payments made between 2011 and 2016 that are related to police violence or, or police misconduct. And what you see oftentimes is that there are officers who have multiple complaints that are multiple, I'm sorry, settlements attached to their names. 
Um, and I encourage everyone who is looking at this today to really take a look at the settling for misconduct database because that's money that we are paying. And that's money that does not guarantee, that is money that like, in, in my opinion, feels much like a payoff to families and in a way to shrink from accountability um, and puts families in an uncomfortable position. Again, am I going to attempt to face, put charges against this officer or am I gonna take this money? And then what does justice look like to you? So outside of settlements, we have this, the, settle, the, the complaints, right? And obviously folks have already mentioned, there's uh, folks from COPA here, um, and then the invisible uh, Bokar and Roman are here as well. They've already spoken about CPDP. And what you see, and what I really appreciate, what, what you see in that database is that between 1988 and 2020, if you were to look at the sustain rate, you will see that um, 90 in Hyde Park specifically, because I wanted to really be specific about when talking about CPDP, in Hyde Park specifically, 91.8% of allegations were found unsustained. That means of the 366, only 30 were sustained. And then of the disciplines, they were really just a majority of one to nine day suspension. If you look at Kenwood, which again, this is from 1988 to 2020, 95.5% of the allegations were found unsustained. Of the 374 allegations, 17 were sustained. And I really appreciate Sydney Roberts bringing up um, the fact that the sustain rate is at 43% now. The number is, that is, is at 43%. And I really believe that is a victory, but I also wanna ground us in the fact that COPA faces so many barriers. Um, and that plays a role, that plays a role in, um, in their, not only their sustained rate, but whether or not officers actually face discipline. Because again, as she uplifted, COPA makes a recommendation. And then that recommend that, that although we, you know, we have these conversations, well, this is a, this is a, a body who is meant to hold folks accountable. It's literally a recommendation, which in many ways feels like a way to pacify people. We've recommended this thing, but it is, but, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's actually going to be done. To me, police accountability looks like defunding the police. It looks like firing officers and investing that money into community, communities who have historically been divested from. It looks like reducing that $1.76 billion budget um, and that that doesn't even include money that we spend on settlements, money that is received through the CPS contract, relationships with folks like the U Chicago Crime Lab, um, and and money that they get for, from civil asset forfeiture. And, and meanwhile, if you were to combine the amount of money that we spend on family and support services, clean water, streets and sanitation, public health, and housing you wouldn't even reach the $1.76 billion that the, the Chicago Police Department already has, right? And so we really need to think about police accountability and the means of systemic change and drastically impacting and, and changing the lives of people who, are, who have been over-policed and over-incarcerated. Um, unfortunately, police officers, I mean, in many ways, police officers have a very limited toolkit. They have a gun, a badge, some handcuffs, a baton, and a taser. And many times what they're doing is their job. It, it is to like um, enforce law. And as how we define the like, um, whether or not those laws should exist. I mean, as we've seen how like marijuana is now legal and like free for folks to, to make money and profit from, but we've seen how folks are still currently incarcerated from marijuana charges or folks whose first charge was a marijuana charge. And then after that first charge, we're more likely statistically to be incarcerated again, right? And so it, it, like, even if we were to think about um, exonerating a bunch of people for, um, for marijuana charges, I mean, I'm sorry, expunging their records of marijuana charges, that does not even begin to, to engage with the level of impact that comes with being incarcerated. My job as an organizer and as a data analyst is to talk about what's currently happening. We've already seen ways that people have talked about police reform. 
We've already seen how people have talked about, you know, how we need body cameras. But for example, in the shooting of Haritha Augustus on 71st and Jeffrey, no up of the five police officers, the, um, every police officer turned on their body camera after the shooting actually occurred. Um, a success to me looks like police accountability in the form of systemic change. And I can't, I can't um, talk about that enough because we are living in a time where a lot of folks are knocking on the door of, evic of evictions and sheriffs and policing are the folks who are to enforce that. Um, we are looking at a time where young people who are in their homes given due to COVID-19 closures, their home orders, um, are maybe are maybe being abused at a, at a higher rate, but we're not able to see that because they're not in touch with mandated reporters. And instead of investing more money and more energy and more effort into social workers or uh, finding ways for mandated reporters to get in touch with the people who are in their homes or um, finding safe places for young people who may have may run away from home in these times of desperation, we instead invest into policing who will then see that young person and, and not have the toolkit or the resources to put them in touch with the people they need to be safe. So my last thing that I'm going to say is that we can't, it's, it's really challenging for me when folks talk about tactical response reports and, 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 and using that as a measure for like, we are doing better, like police are using less, um, less force or they're getting better with the way that they are um, using force. And I think that's also related to the body camera piece because again, if a police officer doesn't turn on their body camera, where does it go? Like who, who, who sees that? And then even if they have their body camera on, there, we have no, like, we are not auditing. We do not have the capacity to truly audit body camera footage. And that goes to, that's the same with tactical response reports. There is no way to audit, or I have not seen a way to audit tactical response reports in a way that makes me feel like we're doing this and, and like um, we are holding officers accountable for when they don't fill out tactical of response reports. What I feel is that we are still dependent on police officers to speak up and say when they did something like use force. And what I've seen specifically in complaints and complaint data is that they don't always fill out their tactical response reports. And then, and then what, right? There are these stories of people who have literally been abused, who have literally been uh, terrorized by by police in their neighborhoods or police on their way home or et cetera. And then the, 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 the responsibility of the record falls on the police to say like, I filled out this tactical response report or falls on the individual who may not have the capacity to file a complaint. We know that underreporting happens. We know that folks have multiple jobs, folks have kids to raise, folks are trying to put food on their tables and, and, and be stable. And although COPA has like an, an, a, 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 a lot of ways that people can file complaints, it is not as simple. It like people are not likely to go to their local police station to file a report on a police officer that just hurt them. People are more likely to go to their local church or to the local shelter or to go to the corner store, right? Like there are all these places, the barbershop, like there are all these places that are, that are rooted in community, that are built for community, that need to be invested in as a form of like, of, of reporting for, reporting around police, police violence and police accountability. And, and until we stop just like depending completely on police themselves to generate, to, to, to like demonstrate what is what is happening and then we use those measurements to define success like i don't think we'll get to any true accountability because if a police officer doesn't want to turn on his body camera or, or if he doesn't want to fill out a tactical response report and he knows that the likelihood of this person going to file a complaint is incredibly low and the pro person probably won't even be believed then or have the capacity to go file a complaint then like are they going to file a tactical response report or are they gonna wait until a complaint happens and then backtrack and say, oh, I forgot. That's my piece. Thank you so much for um, letting me spe um, speak today. Sure, okay, Ms. Tyler, thank you so much for that kind of grassroots perspective of things as well. 
So, okay, we're going to move on to the second part of our program. I'm going to turn it back over to Ali Amora and another board member, Gino Betts, to moderate the second half of our program. Ali? Oh, sorry. Hi, Fallon. Hi. All right, we'll just give a, a couple seconds for everybody here to jump on. Make sure. All right. Um, okay. So um, I uh, want to thank you, Phylin, um for the first part of our event tonight. Um, that concludes the first part. Um, and on behalf of the High Park Kenwood Community Conference, I want to thank our speakers um, who have joined us tonight and who will be staying with us. Um, through the end for the next Q&A, um, Professor Bill Carba, Roman Rivera, uh, Inspector Ferguson, um, Chief, Chief Roberts, um, and Trina uh, Reynolds-Tyler. Um, and I want to thank you to our friends from COPA um, who are joining us for the Q&A, um, Andrea Christian and Ephraim Edi. Um, so um, as a, a quick reminder, we are going to be taking questions that were submitted in advance um, we're going to go for about half an hour or 25 minutes, um, and uh, we are going to open it up to folks who want to ask the question live at that time. So if you would like to, um, you can go ahead and, uh, you know, raise your hand in the chat function, um, and then we'll spend the, the, the last half an hour of our program uh, with questions, um, some from our audience, and then we can get back to some of the ones previously submitted. Um, and so the, this next portion will be moderated by myself and my former and my uh, co-board member from HPKCC, Gino Betts, uh, who is with us tonight. Um, so I want to hand it off to Gino, who's going to start us off. Gino. All right. Thank you, Ali. Uh, just a couple of things before we get going with questions. Uh, I do want to be clear that Chief Roberts of COPA let us know well in advance that she had a conflict at seven o'clock. We do appreciate her making her staff available to uh, take questions on her behalf. That being uh, Chief Investigator Andrea Kirsten and Public Information Officer Ephraim Eady. Also, uh, we will be addressing questions to specific panelists. With that being said, if you hear a question that you wanna chime in on or be heard on, please feel free to just jump in and, uh, and tackle the question. So the first question will be for Inspector Ferguson. And this is a topic that was uh, touched upon by Professor Ba in his presentation. The question is, will publicly scrutinizing police practices lead to more crime and apathetic police officers? Uh, no. Um, uh, that's a, I, I think it, as it was stated by Professor Ba, that's a, that's a trope um, of um, police unions um and um uh, i i disagree with the sort of the, the the data analysis that was offered up uh in that particular presentation as reliable and i think actually trina made some observations that sort of highlight the the, the sort of the questionability of the analysis but i think the point is sort of a valid one there really is no data out there that says um uh, more uh vigorous um oversight um more vigorous accountability in all respects, programmatic and individual officer accountability um, is going to lead to more crime. Um, so, uh, uh, but that's some, but that is something that um, uh, sort of needs to be pushed into uh, for um, analytical purposes. But there's nothing out there that actually substantiates that. All right. Does anyone else want to be heard on that question? Okay. The next question is. And this question is open for everyone, so anyone can answer it. Often, officers, officers fired for misconduct find police work in other jurisdictions. In response, film director Ava DuVernay is working on a project that public, publicly identifies and scrutinizes those officers. What do you think about that approach? I'll, what do you think about it? I'll, I'll jump into that if you'd like. Sure. Yeah. So, look, there is a um, uh, there 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 is a uh, a standard that exists under the law in the context of uh, criminal defense and prosecution that says that um, 
any officer who has previously been um, found to um, uh, be, be um, have lied um, or have engaged in some form of dishonesty um, be on uh, uh, that information be available for future purposes um, uh, in sort of a, what's called a giglio um, log or list and um, uh, something analogous to, and basically what that does is it sort of puts um, lawyers in future cases involving these officers on alert that you have an officer with some credibility issues right and so almost by definition um, an officer you know, may all but be disqualified from testifying in the future. And if they can't testify, then they're not well positioned to actually effectuate arrests and to conduct investigations and all that sort of stuff. They can't be police officers. Take that analogy, and it's not a tight analogy, but apply it to another context. If you have been found to have engaged in serious misconduct, and it can't just sort of be technical rule violations, you didn't have on the right uniform, so on and so forth, but serious violations, that's something that I think arguably should find its way into a national database so that an officer cannot port himself or herself to another jurisdiction to escape the record that exists in the original jurisdiction. So it's that sort of, that sort of database or log that I think would serve us well um, because we know we, everybody here knows of instances um, um, the, the Tamir Rice shooting in, in Cleveland, that was an officer who came from a suburban jurisdiction where he had um, uh, uh, had to leave the department because of serious misconduct involving the use of force, then using force that results in the killing of a 12-year-old, right? He shouldn't have been on that force in, in, in Cleveland. A national database for these sorts of things actually would allow us to do a sort of clearance check um, so that an officer can't move somewhere else. Now, is, is there a model for that type of database anywhere that you're aware of? No. No, nope, um, but as we as as the accountability mechanisms um, and the rigor of, of 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 data maintenance around these things mounts, there's um, uh, technology um, largely takes care of any sort of previous impediments in the ability to actually pull this information together. The FBI on one side of the ledger um, uh, has this massive database on. Um, criminal conduct, arrests, prosecutions, so on and so forth, um, criminal incidents that are reported by police departments. So that exists as a nationwide thing. It's aggregated and it's at the individual department level and so on and so forth. The same thing could be done for the misconduct side of the ledger. And, and Trina, what, what do you think? Oh, Bokar, go ahead. Yeah, so related to the decertification, so with the Invisible Institute and like uh, we essentially FOIA multiple, uh, and uh, USA Today, I think, the FOIA multiple jurisdiction and collected a bunch of decertified officers and released that publicly. Uh, often people say that like it's not possible. Um, we do it and after people follow, uh, but it's possible. It's just like people, the people who are in the room like managing all those data, certification, whatever, are not the one who are concerned by the issues, unfortunately. So that data is available. Uh, related to the Giglio and the Brady list, <clears throat> so just um, one thing that people can do is to uh, file a Freedom of Information Act of the email of uh, uh, the court. Um, essentially, they have the they have like a, um, the set of officers who are on that blacklist. You can. FOIA this information and you can compare that to uh, the public data that is with the OIJ and uh, with uh, uh, the Invisible Institute or with COPA and check if the name, how many names there are on that list and how many names are available uh, on those like complaint data set. You will see that the officer who are like have a Jiggly or a Brad Brady violation is a very, very small number. I did the work already, uh, but uh, I let experts and people who have more resources to do it. So yeah, uh, it's possible. It's just like you have to give yourself the time and energy to do it and uh, yeah. Okay, Andrea, I see you unmuted yourself. 
Oh, I just wanted to add um, that back to the original question, you know, clearly I think we could all agree that we need better systems. We need better communication amongst existing systems. We need databases, et cetera. But in the meantime, I think if anything, um, events of the recent months have just shown what a powerful voice um, on these issues can be spoken from lots of different venues. So I think as members of people involved in the public uh, accountability division and these oversight mechanisms, we need to welcome those kinds of other voices and any opportunity for whether it's a filmmaker or an activist or any other grassroots or local organization to shed light on this, whether it's through FOIA or through whatever mechanism, certainly those are powerful and immediately available tools as we as members of the system have to work better um, to develop long-term solutions such as a database. Thank you. Ali? Uh, thanks, Gino. Um, so switching gears just a little bit, um, you know, and, and Chief Roberts had, had mentioned a little bit about like this um, blue coat of silence and how police departments, um, including our own here in Chicago, are known for having a blue coat of silence. Um, and, you know, we, we've seen something recently um, that kind of has, you know, uh, sounded very familiar um, with um, uh, the unions, you know, push toward, you know, against um, officers for engaging in, in, in kneeling, which, which for me sounds very much like this kind of blue coat of silence. So I was wondering if, you know, Ephraim and, and, and Andrea, you guys could talk about COPA's experiences with that practice and strategies used um, to break down that type of obstruction? Sure. Um, I think first and foremost, it's sort of um, incumbent on all of us to deconstruct sort of this concept of what the code of silence is. Um, I really appreciate the example that you just raised um, because I think, you know, we have an idea in sort of whether it's um, movies or the entertainment industry or what have you about how that looks and that it's, you know, the intent covering up of a crime or failing to report your officers, mis your fellow officers misconduct. Certainly those things also are clear examples of the code of silence, but we also find often it's much more sort of benign day-to-day -day interactions, whether it's the, the way in which you draft a report using the same stock language that's always shaded in favor of the police and their actions or, um, <clears throat> or something on just more of a low level, like understanding and expanding what we really think of as the code of silence to encompass a larger swath of what is just standard operating procedure in most police departments in particular particularly within the Chicago Police Department, um, is something we've gone to great lengths to, to try to deconstruct um, at COPA. The main tools that we have for targeting, um, you know, actions of intentional lying or um, misleading of information, a lack of candor in our interviews, are some of the, the, the rules that officers have to abide by. They're under an obligation to cooperate with our interviews. It's an obligation that we remind them of uh, very directly when they're confronted with evidence and when we sit across the table from them and interrogate them about the incident. Um, that, that is what we are, we are discussing, is their duty to cooperate, the penalties for when they don't. And then we have, um, we have to confront them with evidence that we have to the contrary. So that's kind of how we go at it on an individual level, but looking at things on a more broad, broad uh, level Level, tends, in my estimation, to really uh, go back to some of what I was talking about, the report writing, um, the way in which um, certain districts handle certain types of incidents, those types of things. Um, to your specific example with respect to the protests and, you know, speaking out so harshly against officers that were supporting protesters and kneeling, mm -hmm. um, I understand your perspective on that. I think there is, there are a lot of restrictions placed on the officers um, by the, their own department about involvement and engagement in political speech of any kind. So it becomes a slippery slope, um, but certainly you don't see the unions coming out um, in you know, a full-throated uh, criticism yeah. of an officer wearing a thin blue line t-shirt or you know, nope. supporting things the other way. So to mm -hmm. your point, it's a valid one. It becomes difficult on a misconduct, individual misconduct level um, to evaluate some of those things. But I, I think it speaks to some of the, the broader agenda behind a lot of those types of public statements by the unions. And if I can just add, um, one of the things that we also have um, implemented with COPA uh, as an approach that was not a part of prior iterations of civilian oversight, particularly in the city of Chicago, uh, our engagement function, we really look at engagement as not only the residents of the city of Chicago, but also law enforcement. So even from a, a level of engaging with uh, uh, Chicago police, we actually are meeting with, we present and meet with every recruit of the Chicago Police Department 
to help them understand one, um, who we are as an agency, that they are gonna be uh, treated fairly. Obviously, we understand um, the maybe the view that, and perception that people may have of COPA, but by us at least engaging at the recruit level. And then for every sergeant, lieutenant, and captain that's promoted, we actually go out and have conversations and talk with them as well. Uh, and we have in the past done some um, early visits in roll calls, and we, that's something that we also want to uh, resume again. But uh, our ability to go out and make sure that we're talking to law enforcement officers as much as we talk to the community can also be helpful in officers being hopefully forthcoming by understanding our full process and getting an opportunity to meet, meet some of us on a personal and professional level. Uh, we hope that that can uh, help change the culture also. Gotcha, thank you both. Um, you know, uh, Bokhar, um, if you can unmute yourself. Yeah, um, yeah please chime in. Yeah, so maybe uh, there's a code of silence problem because the incentives that we are giving the police officer is a bit um, like, essentially they are doing what we're asking them to do. And uh, I suspect that like police officer, if we look at carefully in the data, there is a positive correlation with police officer who are making a lot of arrests, officer who have a lot of complaints, and officer who have a lot of awards. So essentially, Officer who are preventing crime, letting a kid go rather than arresting him for a petty crime is going to be punished. Okay. So what do we how come we come up with a system that like reward reward the officer that like prevented a crime rather than like essentially arresting someone that is very easy to arrest? Oh, you're muted, Boca. Yeah. So That's maybe okay. yeah, maybe there are ways like to simply ask the community, not like a police officer. So maybe one thing that the city could do is evaluate officer. So essentially every month, randomly um, uh, survey uh, people in each bit and, like, and ask them to grade the quality about the, the uh, to, to survey about the crime in the, the, the community and the perception and see that over time and reward like beats where crime is going down or up, but the community is satisfied with the treatment they receive. And, that's, and that doesn't like tie in directly to the sergeant mm -hmm. or to the police department. It's just like an officer knows that he's working in that beat, might not have made a lot of arrests, might not have put his hands on as many people as possible, essentially, but he's rewarded for being kind and nice uh, to the people in the community. And those people in the community, I don't know, you ask them 10, 15 minutes, you reward them like 20, 30 bucks to give them their opinion about what's going on. I think the city will save a bunch of money this way. And like a bunch of officer will be happy not to arrest people they should not have arrested at the first place because they're just easy to talk to arrest and maybe everyone would be happy. Uh, that's a very easy stuff to do that both sides would be happy. And um, yeah, so that's, I think a, that's, that's, that's an idea. I don't know. Um, but based on the data that I look at, the police officer that make a lot of, they're arresting a bunch of people that are just easy to arrest, not the people who are like problematic. Mm. That's a, it is a, it's an interesting suggestion. Um, and thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I think, uh, Inspector Ferguson, did you want to also comment? Yes, um, okay. very, very quickly. Um, uh, the Justice Department and the task force noted that it is not safe and there's not a safe environment and medium for good cops to actually report the bad, the bad behavior of their colleagues. Um, there's a very simple mechanism for that, and that is um, uh, the, uh, a, a, a portal that allows um, police officers to anonymously report um, uh, misconduct by their fellow officers. Um, we created that um, a couple years ago. Um, former Superintendent Johnson did not direct the department to support it. Um, your question particularly is, how can the new top cop break the grip on, uh, the, of the code of silence on good cops? Um, he can say every time that we know that there has been misconduct, every officer who is present um, will himself be subject to discipline if there has not been the filing of an anonymous complaint through this safe portal 
to alert us to it in advance. It's really simple. And the, the mechanism has been built by the IG's office um, uh, under, the, under the new superintendent. It's been put on, on the radar screen, but it's really simple. The tone starts at the top. And if there's accountability for the duty to report, um, suddenly we all have a lot more information and officers engaged in misconduct in the field know there's no protection. Thank you. I, I mean, I think that's, and if it's required of them, I think then, you know, it's, uh, it, it becomes uh, kind of a different, a different ball game. Um, so thank you all um, uh, for that wonderful conversation on, on the code of silence. I want to, I want to bring it back to Gino. Um, and I think Gino, once we kind of take the next um, topic, we'll then open it up for folks who want to ask questions live. Okay. So the next set of questions will address the role of civilians in uh, police accountability. The first question will be for Andrea Ephraim and Inspector Ferguson. How can neighborhood watch groups work with COPA and the Office of the Inspector General to hold police accountable? I can start. Uh, I think the first thing we can do is for the more people understand what our process looks like, the more um, we can engage people of the communities that are affected by this issue in our process. Uh, I think this was especially brought to light in the recent um, influx of cases we received with the protest uh, related incidents. You know, we got hundreds more cases in a very short period of time. And I think a lot of people fundamentally don't understand, Chief sort of alluded to it, um, uh, Inspector Ferguson's kind of talking about it. There are so many barriers to, to complaints and moving forward in misconduct in, in investigations and policing, right? Whether it's a signed affidavit requirement or the fact that we can't proceed on anonymous complaints in most situations um, because of the collective bargaining agreement that officers have entered into, et cetera. So under, having an educational um, situation in which the, these community groups understand what some of these barriers are means that we will hopefully be able to kind of keep people involved. We found a lot of people, I'm getting back to the protest, we found a lot of people would give us that video, that clip, that 10 second or 20 second clip showing the incident and then that was it. They weren't really interested in any further conversation with us. They didn't want to be subjected to interviews and we understand it's, it's not pleasant, it's not always convenient, um, but we're willing to go to folks' houses, we'll do it over the phone, we'll do whatever it is, but I think a lot of individuals think, well, we told you, we told you, we showed you what it was. That's what you need. Um, unfortunately, the way the laws currently are and the rules currently work, we need more than just that. So number one, I think would just be helping to raise awareness about how the process really works um, so that people will hopefully trust us in that process and be able to communicate um, vastly important evidence and cooperate with us on things like signed affidavits in order to move forward in many of these matters. And I would just, just adding to what Andrea said, and that's part of what we uh, attempt to do uh, when we're out in the community. Uh, we meet with a lot of groups, um, particularly at whether it's ward meetings, black club meetings, churches, um, you name it, we try to meet with them. However, uh, we appreciate this question because we had not developed a strategy uh, for neighborhood watch programs. And I think that is an excellent place for us to not only make introduction, but to talk about specifically when incidents occur, one of the things that our uh, the team that I uh, oversee uh, does is we actually try to identify organizations and community stakeholders and find out who maybe can share information and make sure that they are aware of us. But if we could do that uh, in particular with neighborhood watch programs, making sure that we're reaching out to the head of that neighborhood watch program when an incident occurs, then maybe there's an information loop that can be shared. Even if there's places which we have within uh, almost every community where we can have investigators and uh, potential witnesses meet up. And if the neighborhood watch is the trusted vessel within that particular community, we would be more than happy uh, in, in, in allowing them in so many words to, to develop the strategy. And we've done that with some community groups. And I think the neighborhood watch program is definitely a place that we can, uh, we can improve our relationships. And so if from this conversation, someone can help facilitate that, all we need is one, and I'm sure they can connect us to us. <laughs> Do you want me to jump in here, Ali? Yes, please. Um, uh, I, I, I think Andrea and Ephraim both have key components of this exactly right. Um, what each of them boils down to is more information. Um, 
I, I have a little bit of a different view. Um, our office has a, a different view of how meaningful um, the affidavit requirement is as a restriction. Um, there's a process, um, and we'll report out on this fairly soon, there's a process for overriding the affidavit requirement that historically has been grossly underused by the primary investigative agencies. Um, uh, and uh, it can be used much more extensively. That coupled with the fact that um, there are some sea changes that are out there. There actually, one was in the news today. Um, the City Council Public Safety Committee um, and um, uh, Workforce Development Committee um, approved um, the um, contract for sergeants and lieutenants um, that um, is the result of interest arbitration, which eliminates the anonymous uh, complaint bar. Um, and that coupled with a more effective use of the affidavit requirement means that um, there re really is not a meaningful impediment. There's a little bit more the agencies have to do, but it's not an impediment, it's not a bar, um, but everything starts with the amount of information that we, we receive. And um, uh, Ephraim and Andrea are both right that um, the information can be received in all sorts of different ways. It doesn't necessarily have to take the form of an individual walking in and providing their name and the information and an affidavit. It can be done in more safe environments um, where um, community organizations, watch groups, exactly as Ephraim says, sort of brings people together and facilitates conversation that gives us all a sense of the types of things that are going on in their neighborhood. And um, whether it ends up being a formal complaint or not, that starts to be stuff that we can dig into to figure out whether there's some larger behavioral issues, there's some larger supervisory issues, who these officers are within this jurisdiction, go and pull their records, start to look at what sorts of indicia that there may be. Early, early intervention systems here um, come into play. All of these things come together, but everything starts with information from the community. And, and, and I'm going to add this, this one last piece, and I appreciate Joe Ferguson and what he just said, because we found uh, specifically uh, in the fourth uh, district, fourth police district, when we were first launching our strategy for engaging people within the community, uh, we looked at, uh, not only did we look at the amount of complaints and where they were coming from, but we also looked at the uh, amount of police interactions. And in one particular community in, in the fourth district, there were a high level of um, police interactions, low level of complaints, and we could not find out why. And as we found one organization who opened up their doors, we found out that there was a fear of retaliation and deportation. And so often, if we can find out the reason why people may have a fear, maybe it's travel, maybe it's our, the complication of our web complaints, whatever it is, we can work through those issues to try to make it easier to get resources to them and meet their needs where they are. Sure, and I just, I just want to add too, we certainly exercise our affidavit override requirements much more frequently than past iterations of, of either um, IPRA or before it did. But even with that ability, we still often need that interview with the individual. There's often a video, one of the main things that we end up training about in, in our academy is that video evidence, while powerful and it tells a lot of the story, it often doesn't tell the whole story one way or the other. It's sort of the beginning of an investigation. Now, certainly there are some videos so powerful and profound and complete that you don't need to know a lot much more. Um, but in many instances, we, we need that other additional information and we need that contact and conversation um, with the affected individual, whether they want to sign an affidavit or not is a different matter, um, but it's those conversations and they can be informal, they can be over the phone, they can be, um, to Trina's points, in other, in other parts of the neighborhood that are more accessible. You know, those are things that we as an agency are willing to do. We have staff on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and, you know, and when there are people that need um, us to come to them, we try to make that possible. So, um, but again, it's about raising the awareness and getting the word out there um, that this doesn't have to be a one size fits all model <clears throat> investigation. They don't have to come to West Town in order to file a complaint um, when they live uh, in Hyde Park or Camwood. So anyway. And, and, and that's, Andrea makes a really critical point here. Put aside anonymous complaint bars, put aside affidavit requirements or the perception of how far they go and whether we're doing well or not doing well with the overrides. The fact of the matter is, is that a, a one and done, drop the information and go away, 
makes it almost impossible in many situations to actually get the critical information that we all know is necessary in order to identify the specific officer, pin it down to a specific location, to identify other possible witnesses. Um, those sorts of details inevitably um, are required, um, uh, require that follow-up conversation um, and that broader conversation. And if, in fact, we're moving to a world where anonymity um, actually can be um, maintained and, um, uh, and a basis for action, for investigative action, all the way to disciplinary outcome, um, then it makes it more possible for, and once folks understand that, makes it more possible for maybe us to sort of acculturate folks and socialize folks into the notion that we want the information, but, it, but you really need to sort of accept our call coming back to you to say, hey, look, we have some additional questions here. We really need your help. And we really need your help identifying who else might be able to tell us information about this situation as well. Okay, so for the last question, I, wanted, I want to direct it to Trina and Roman, we haven't heard from you guys yet, and I'm sure everyone will have an opinion about this question. So there are two proposed plans to incorporate civilian participation in police accountability. The Grassroots Alliance for Police Accountability, also known as GAPA, and the Civilian Police Accountability Council, also known as CPAC. Under GAPA, the mayor retains control over the hiring and firing of the CPD superintendent and the COPA chief administrator. However, under CPAC, an elected civilian board would take on those responsibilities. Which ordinance do you support and why? So, um, it is my personal belief that the power should be in the people's hands. I think that when I was growing up on 54th and Drexel, I think I don't, I don't I don't know if that's right in the Hyde Park barrier or if it's like really more Washington Park it's like right on the border but I remember um, people in my community knowing what officers would be quote unquote on dirt with them right what officers are typically uh, committing harms against people um, and I think the power of CPAC is that the power is in the people's hands. I personally believe that our current mayor has a deep relationship with the police, the Chicago Police Department. And I think this is rooted in her history in OPS, right? The Office of Professional Standards that now no longer exists because you know, something happened and then IPRA became, came into existence and then something happened and then COPA came into existence. And now we're, you know, we're seeing what's going on with like how COPA, how things change um, based in how COPA decides to respond to these things. But I think Mayor Lightfoot has quite a bit of power already. Let's take that off of her plate and let's put it in the hands of the people. I think that if we do something like uh, allow the mayor of Chicago to retain, like to have the hiring and firing power. I think that we put her in a position where uh, there might be a conflict of interest, specifically because of the way that like politics are funded in this city because of her current position as like the person who already appoints like so many other um, really important like bodies in this city. Um, and I think that when we put her in a position where she has that power, we're putting even the people who are in those positions in, in places where they, they are not able to, um, they, they are in positions where they might, uh, where they may, be, may not be able to make the decisions they desire to make because of the, the various relationships that folks have in this city with police policing and the FOP specifically. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's, I 100% agree with that. I think uh, more specifically, or basically just repeating what you just said, Trina, is that uh, if you put it in the hands of the mayor alone, you're just adding another layer of political complications 
and obfuscation around who is actually in control of things. The police union in Chicago is incredibly powerful and it's a concentrated interest. Civilians are diffuse interest. And so you're gonna have more problems, or at least I don't think it'll be an excellent solution if you just hand more power to the executive part of Chicago. Whereas, uh, I haven't looked at the plan yet for CPAC, but I would be curious to see how the elections um, will be conducted and to see how the people who are uh, selected will end up getting there. Um, if they come from the specific communities and like even more granular locations um, within the city, I'd be, I would be more supportive of that as well. Um, because you need to make sure that the people who are going to be on these boards are not just going to be people who are very interested in police accountability, right, um, it, from either side of the interest spectrum, right, which is an issue we've had in the past uh, with OP civilian oversight boards, that the people who are very interested um, in police oversight may be those who are very interested in making sure officers do not have complaints sustained against them. Um, yeah. Thank you. Ali? All right, thanks, Gino. Um, okay, so we have, um, it's about 7.40. We have, um, I wanna turn it over. We have one person who's raised their hand and um, we have Stephanie Franklin with us. Um, so I would like um, to, I'm gonna allow you to talk, Stephanie. Um, Stephanie, are you, oh, if you can unmute, let's see, I'll unmute you. All right, are you with us, Stephanie? Yes, can you hear me? I can hear you. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We're really happy to have you. Um, and, um, you know, please take it away. Mindful, we have about 20 minutes left. So please um, keep your questions as, as, as short as possible. Um, and the floor is yours, Stephanie. I think I just have one question. I'm hearing a lot about investigative bodies, and there seem to be several of them. The problem is that investigative bodies investigate after an incident has happened. And what I would like to see is these incidents not continuing to happen at all. So I'm questioning, there's a big movement about defunding police departments I'm wondering if the better answer wouldn't be to disarm police departments so they don't have lethal weapons. They have tasers, they have batons, they have a whole bunch of training in things like um, subduing people. Um, and so maybe what they should, what should be eliminated is the police able to use lethal force Maybe they shouldn't be allowed to do that because it's fine to investigate the incidents after they happen and after somebody's been shot, but I would like to see the incidents stop and people not getting shot. And so uh, this is a question for all of you. Um, what would happen if the police were no longer armed but had only those weapons that could perhaps disable somebody and not kill them. That's Thank you, Stephanie. Question. Thank you, Stephanie. That's a great question. And, and as a, uh, um, for those who don't know, Stephanie uh, Franklin is also an HPKCC board member and the chair of our safety committee. Um, that's a very wonderful question. I will, I will leave Thank it up to the, to, to the floor. Thank you. Um, whoever wants to start first. I would jump in just to say I love that question um, because I think that, again, I keep talking about the events of recent months. I mean, this is something that I'm, this is an issue I'm obviously very passionate about. This is something I've been working at well before, you know, the last 60, 90 days of occurrences in our, in our country. But what I think the recent incidents, starting with George Floyd's murder, um, really show for all of us is that we are at a point where the country is no longer willing to accept what has always been accepted before. And so what I like about um, Ms. Franklin's question is that I think even, you know, six months ago, that question might have been much more of a political non-starter, right? But I think at this point, there's no, there's no reason we can't 
we can't ask those questions. And I think Chief Roberts touched on this, you know, misconduct on the back end. Yes, our, what, why, what I do matters and it's important, but to, to Ms. Franklin's point, um, and Chief Roberts definitely talked about this, we have to reform how we police. And I don't think anything should be off the table in that conversation. Um, and I think that all of the voices of the communities that are most impacted by these issues are who need to be listened to in the conversations, not just political stakeholders, et cetera. So that's all. I just want to say I appreciate the question. I don't know the answer, but, but I appreciate the question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and and um, just to complicate it some more, we have a, a, a comment in our chat that says, great question, though George Floyd was not shot. So there is a complicated answer. Um, and I'll turn it back over to those who want to jump in here. Roman, did you want to go or should I? I was uh, briefly going to add on to what Andrea said, which is just that uh, Police kill people in all sorts of ways. Uh, George Floyd and Eric Garner were choked to death. Um, that happens frequently. Tasing people to death happens. Um, people get hit with cars. There's a lot of uh, traffic involved accidents when it comes to cop killings. And Chicago in particular, actually very interestingly, it's actually one of the better place when it comes to police shootings when you control for all uh, various confounding variables. Um, so I, I would be very curious to see if any city in, in the United States would agree to disarm police forces. But again, it's about how police officers police and the decisions they make, and not just whether or not we can take away one element that is used uh, to take a life. Because at the end of the day, hands and knees are also deadly weapons. Yeah, Trina? I'm, I'll be quick, because I know we're running low on time. Um, I think that defunding the police and reducing the proximity of police to people is really the answer here. Um, Andrea Ritchie in her book called Invisible No More talks about sexual assault at the hands of, or in, and gender violence generally at the hands of police across the nation. And um, essentially what happens is like by, by way of the proximity of the police, we're opening the door for like violent encounters. I think many people, even folks who are attendees, can probably agree that if they see blue lights behind them, they get a little bit nervous. I know many people who tense up at the, at the sight of a police officer near them, even though they've not done anything wrong. And so I think to me, it's more about reducing the power, the proximity, and like the amount of money that we put into policing. And I, I think that's the answer to making sure that it doesn't happen again. All right, um, thank you all. Uh, I wanna pass it back to, um, to Gino, um, well, we have, we, have, we have a few more people who have raised their hands. Um, and Gino, do you want to uh, take it away to the next person? Gino might have frozen, okay. We have uh, Damon Arnold with us. Um, Damon, I'm going to unmute you and, what does that mean? Thank you. Um, oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. And Damon is also uh, one of um, our board members for HPKCC. So welcome, Damon, and the floor is yours. Oh, thank you. You know, I, um, you know, I'm, you know, I was a flight surgeon and a combat medic. Um, so I did a couple of tours in Iraq, and um, I, I protected everyone who was there. That was my my role uh, to save lives. And when I was there, if someone did something to anyone in the community. Um, and we had a, a dual role of, you know, force protection and that kind of thing. But um, if someone did someone, anything to anyone, the JAG officer would come in, you would have, you know, the person being questioned, you brought them to a, you know, into a almost like a, a military court martial to find out what exactly happened when you went into the town and this, this death occurred. And um, so I got back here to the United States after a couple of combat tours there, one in Afghanistan, one in Kuwait. And I got back here and then I hear Trayvon Martin's story. And I'm wondering why is it that someone who is unarmed uh, is killed by someone who has no legal authority whatsoever to carry a weapon? So I think we have a culture of violence as well. And uh, I, so, you know, I really, I'm wondering, the thing that we had over there was a set of rules of engagement. And I don't see the same thing here. We were trained about how to engage with people and I don't see it 
in the, in the police force is up to them to decide how they're going to engage people. And uh, I think there needs to be a stricter code on that, uh, you know, a stricter set of rules uh, for them to follow. And if, you know, why are we waiting to 127 violations, you know, uh, before we say, you know, someone needs to intervene, this person needs counseling, they need tra retraining, something needs to go on earlier in their career and take them out of this career if they can't, uh, you know, measure up. So just more on that, you know, how, you know, what do you think the role is for early intervention in misconduct and also uh, what kinds of rules of engagement should officers carry with them in the community? That's, uh, that's, that's a good question. Um, anyone wanna jump in for that? Early intervention is um, uh, on the tape. So the consent decree works in a way in which um, there is um, sort of a multi-year schedule for when the police department is obligated to begin to take certain steps in certain areas, which then um, essentially authorizes the monitor to begin to make assessments around those areas. In the next couple reporting periods of the monitor, and remember the monitorship is going just into its second year, um, early intervention systems are on the roster, um, which means the department is working right now from our understanding pretty hard and focused on early intervention systems. And uh, in order to do that effectively, um, you need to draw upon a lot of sources. Um, but one of those sources actually is making much better use of, of, of complaint data and information from the community um, uh, regarding much more subtle indicia of, 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 of problematic attitudes or crisis um, with officers. So I'll give you sort of one example of something that's always a challenge. If you have an officer um, who is accused of, um, <clears throat> and, and, and it sort of gets introduced into COPA, the COPA, COPA actually is the intake point for all complaints, no matter what source they come from, um, of, of using um, uh, uh, racially biased or prejudicial language. Um, uh, or sort of verbal aggression of a racial nature, racist nature. So um, many times, um, for reasons that Andrea noted, um, you can't, there's not, there's not follow-up information, you're not able to get sort of corroborative information from other witnesses. They boil down to kind of he said, she said, he said, he said situations. And that doesn't get you to the threshold that you need for actually finding that the officer did what was alleged. Um, but if you have three, four, five of those complaints, regardless of what the outcome is, in an early intervention system, that's a warning sign. Um, and it's time to call that officer in because that's somebody who is sort of manifesting in ways that may signal more serious behavior in the future. There's other sorts of information as well um, that sort of comes from, that needs to come from the colleagues of the officer. And that's where this anonymous tip sort of line comes in for officers to be able to safely say, hey, look, I've got a partner or a colleague who appears to be in crisis and is sort of engaging in aggressive ways that may not be the subject of complaints. Um, and, and, and then active supervision and trained supervision. Sergeants aren't trained to actually sort of in the, in the HR realm to actually know how to supervise people and identify these crisis issues. All of this sort of feeds early intervention at something that's next up on the horizon under the monitorship and the department's gonna have to do that. Um, but there's one thing that, that Damon's remarks and everyone's remarks sort of, sort of moves, sort of doesn't quite fully grab. In this country, we have 400 million firearms out on the street. So when we talk about what we want the police to do and not do, we have, to, we have to deal with the reality of the Second Amendment and the culture that exists around the Second Amendment. And Damon's absolutely right. This is a violent culture, and it's a violent culture that's armed. And that's part of the challenge that we have here. Can I make one quick comment on that? Uh, and one thing you know, I really feel about that is that um, you know, we also have a civic responsibility to make sure that we do reporting as well when we see things. Because that 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 sends a that sends a police officer into a very very dangerous situation when we withhold information and we don't let them know something is going on here, and it also sets up the the, the groundwork for something like these things to happen as well. And it's not to exonerate them of their responsibility and because people are doing bad things uh, who are police officers, 
but uh, it, we also have a sort of a responsibility to also have a dual protection uh, function with ourselves. Can I just add one thing? I mean, I, sure. I wanted to touch on um, Damon's comments regarding the rules of engagement, so to speak, which is more of the militaristic version. Um, but officers are under, in every police department, including Chicago, um, under their own department directives regarding the use of force. And those are publicly available. And I definitely recommend people go and read what they are prescribed um, to do and in what situations. Um, 2017, they actually changed the use of deadly force um, in order, in kind of in response to a lot of the, the fallout from the Laquan McDonald's murder. Um, and, you know, they, one of the things they did was to prioritize the sanctity of life and to make that a, a directive in their own um, department general orders. So on the books and in paper, you know, you see a lot of the things that I think as, as community members you want, you would want to see, right? But what sometimes is lacking, there's a disconnect between what's written as a directive and what that means and how it's actualized when an officer is engaging um, with someone on the street. And so making meaningful some of the requirements that they put in, that that's the job of people like me, that's COPA's job, and also the department's job when they're training, that this isn't just the same old order and the sanctity of life is just thrown in there, but at the end of the day, you're going to go home safe no matter what, uh, which is kind of how the training often gets presented um, to recruits. You know, you, they need to, the goal needs to be not to have to use force, right? The goal needs to be that you use these other tactics to de-escalate the situation. Instead of getting awards um, for shooting your way out of a scenario, get awards for not having to use weapons um, or force. So that's kind of the same point that I think someone else was talking about. Was it Bokar? Um, sort of the same idea. I think that, and this goes to what Chief Roberts' original message was, like, we have to reform the way in which we ask the police to police, right? And that, that we can't do that through accountability alone on the back end. That's, that's a reckoning that's going to have to happen within every single police department um, to really move forward in that direction. Okay, the last question will be from Angel Alvarez. Angel, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, uh, so uh, I used FOIA and publicly available data to perform analysis on police interventions in the Chicago public school system. And I find disproportionate usage that strongly is predictive of uh, low income, race, and the school administration. And particularly problematic is the disproportionate use of police force among black girls or with black girls. And I, I'm preparing a proposal for CPS. And I wanted to ask Trina or Joe if they have this data or looked into something similar and if they also know what the outcome of these children um, happen to be. Basically, if police intervention with them is gonna theoretically scare them straight or if it actually ends up um, putting them on a road to basically further incarceration and robbing them of the opportunity to uh, learn. Thank you. Um, hey, Angel, if you could send me an email, my email is Trina at InvisibleInstitute.com. I'll repeat that, T-R-I-N-A at InvisibleInstitute.com. I would really, really, really love to chat more with you about you. what you just I'm sorry. I would love that too. Yeah, um, I think that what the of the research that I have seen, I think there's a lot of sexual assault, a lot of sexual harassment that happens specifically to black women and girls um, that we don't talk about. I think when people think about police violence, they think about the murder of a black man, but they don't think about nearly as much of uh, the sexual assault, which is even more underreported right, because of, of the kind of victim blaming, the, the kind of rhetoric that we have around sexual assault and sexual violence. And I think that um, it doesn't, no way, it is in no way, shape or form that violence will scare people straight. Um, I think that what violence does is that it has some serious mental impact, like serious like impact on the ways that people um, move in the world, and I think that um, it significantly harms people in the long run. Please send me an email. We should chat. I will. And I also encourage people to look at Push Out by, I think her name is Monique. It's a book that talks specifically about Black women, um, Black girls in like the Push Out and into the carceral state. Angel. Um, oh, um, yes. 
Go ahead, Joe. Thank you. Yeah, I think yeah, um, uh, Angela. I'll 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 just add. So it, it sounds like you're you're going to feed this information to CPS, and I think this is sort of information that actually is important to have in the hands of of local school councils and those that are testifying or or, or speaking at um, the local school council meetings um, in the next month around whether to keep um, SROs uh, in schools. Um, uh, and I think it's important information to get in the hands of um, almost any alderman um, in the city council right now, because um, like I said earlier, there was a five hour hearing on SROs and there's gonna be another hearing on it as well. And the city council actually has to approve the contract uh, to renew this program for another year. Um, beyond that, from a data perspective, if you go to igchicago.org and go on to the arrest um, uh, data um, uh, page on the public safety portal, um, uh, you can actually filter arrest information on the basis of location all the way down to whether it occurred at a school address. And um, what we know from uh, a racial demographic breakdown is depending on the category of intervention, uh, criminal justice intervention or law enforcement intervention on schools, 87 to 96% uh, involve um, arrests of students um, of color. Um, and I think that correlates directly to what you're doing. It, uh, you're looking specifically at, uh, at gender as well. I think you can break it down by gender. That's at the arrest level, but then there's also at the incident level, and that sounds like what you're getting into, but I think the data that's uh, publicly available on our website actually syncs up with what you're doing. Yeah, uh, arrested are hard to come by because you get a police officer come in, threaten a child, push the child out of school so they withdraw, and essentially you just raise the test scores, particularly if that child is a low, test, um, a low testing student. So you artificially raise the performance of the school by getting rid of students who have uh, behavioral problems, probably from you know trauma. And so I wanted to look at incidents rather than arrests because uh, arrests are hard to come by. CPS, I think even knew. It's hard for us to know how many kids were arrested in CPS. Okay, it's, let's, it's, let's end it with uh, Professor Bach. Yeah. Thank you. So essentially, this is something I, I think I was extremely frustrated with in Chicago. So essentially it's like, it's actually related to the consent decree. Uh, the city, the different agency in the city um, choose who are evaluating them. And uh, essentially there's like some cherry picking here. Uh, so um, I've been trying like to get data on like Chicago public school for years to look at the impact of like, uh, essentially the police misconduct data on CPS data, okay? The problem is uh, the people the people who are like managing the data um, are buddy buddy with some researchers, okay? And they choose the question they care about. And if it doesn't make them look good, no one knows what's going on until something dramatic happened like George Floyd. After the George Floyd incident, I received many emails from my classmates at the time would deny the proposal about looking at those kind of incidents. Be like, oh, by the way, do you have the Invisible Institute data? I have the plug to work on the data. Can we work together? So there is this problem here going on in Chicago. I don't know if someone is going to address it, but like the city is wasting a lot of money by uh, cherry picking why, why I evaluated them. And the stuff is very easy. Most of the report that comes from researchers are always positive. We never see bad, bad news coming from researchers and people need to be cautious because essentially we have a problem there uh, in the city in terms of like science in general, accountability in general. So uh, Angel, thank you for your question. Um, I've been working on that for a long time, but it's very hard the data you're trying to do and to be able to analyze it in a more systematic way and not an anecdotal way, it's gonna be very hard and very challenging if someone doesn't find a way to essentially bring people from different backgrounds to study that. So what's going on in Chicago is like, uh, you have like people who are educated in general who happen to not be coming from those community. You can listen to my accent, I'm not from here. We do not have the institutional information of what's going on in the community. We can do the math, we can do the data, whatever, but we do not have the literacy of what's going on in the community. 
And on the other end, people from the community do not have the literacy of like those technocrat, but we give the benefit of the doubt to the, de the technocrat or the PhD, whatever, you Chicago, whatever. But we essentially, there is an imbalance of power that we're like, essentially, the two sides don't speak the same language, but we give the benefit of the doubt to the city and politician and like the technocrat. So is this just something I have to say uh, in terms of like data accountability in the city um, to make it available to more diverse set of researchers, not to the private, not to an elite private institution who has their own like interest. So yeah, anyway. Okay, great. Um, thank you everyone uh, so much. Uh, we could probably go on for at least another hour or more. Um, it is 8.05 um, and I am gonna turn it over to uh, HPKCC board president, uh, Phylin Crawford to close us out. Um, on behalf of myself and Gino, um, to all of our panelists, thank you so much. And to all of our um, uh, speakers and to our guests who submitted questions, thank you. I will turn it over now to Phylin Crawford. Hello. On behalf of the High Park Kenwood Community Conference, thank you for joining us for tonight's community forum on police accountability. I'd like to thank our guests, Professor Barr, Mr. Rivera, Inspector Ferguson, Chief Roberts, and Ms. Tyler. I'd also like to thank uh, Shaza Papa, who created our beautiful flyer, Iman Ali, our social media consultant, and our organizers, Gary Osaward, Ali Amora, Barbara Marino Paschal, Mila Jamison, Gino Betts, and Nina Helstein. This conversation does not end tonight, and HPKCC would like your voices to continue to be heard. If you'd like to learn more about HPKCC or get involved, please visit our website at hydepark.org. To become a member of our organization, like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. HPKCC will be holding a follow-up community dialogue on criminal justice in August. Please visit our website, hydepark.org, to learn more about that. You can also join HPKCC at our next board meeting on Thursday, August 6th at 7 p.m. on Zoom. Thank you, stay safe, and good night. <laughs>